to be in God's house? I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them why it's good to be in God's house tonight. Just, just find somebody and tell them why. Tell them why you're glad to be in God's house tonight. Okay. Take your hymnals and stand with me because we're going to higher ground. We're not going to setting ground. We're going to higher ground. Let's sing together tonight. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights and gaining every day. Still praying. As I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane that I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no where doubts arise and fears dismay, though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts and be unheard. For some has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's table land. I want to share the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory ride. I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table. open this service in prayer tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day that you bestowed upon us, Lord. Thank you for each person here, Lord. Be with those that are shut in our special prayer requests, Lord. And thank you for all you've done. We love you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You never can forget that what we are all about as the body of Christ is not just the here and the now, but it's also about the there and the then. That's the higher ground both spiritual growth as well as a home in heaven. But, you know, you don't want to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. So I'll let you sit down so you can sing deeper, deeper. 475. <coughs> How good it is to have the leading of the Lord in our lives. Take me deeper in your spirit, in the trials, whatever comes. Take me deeper in the love of Jesus. Deeper, deeper in the love of Jesus, daily let me go. Higher, higher in the school of wisdom, for of grace to know. Oh, deeper yet I pray, and higher every day. And why? Yeah, I'm 
maybe it's not on the screen or maybe it's coming up next, but we skip three. I want us to sing three and I will see if it comes up. If it doesn't come up, well, you'll just have to listen. Here we go. Deeper, deeper, though we cross the trials. to hymn number 495, The Gift of Love. I love uh, Mildred Banks Wine Coop's A Theology of Love. Her whole premise on sanctification is that sanctification is love perfected in the believer's life. That God sets our hearts to fire and aflame with His love. Let's sing this song that's new to me. Let's sing it together tonight. that we read today. But oh my, we read so much today in the concept of the power of our spoken word. Turn tonight to 572, He hideth my soul.
Yes. My son's go class this morning, but I might be here tonight. I, three weeks ago, I got some blood work that wasn't quite so good. And I had to go back and repeat it. Uh, and uh, thank the Lord. Folks so get around prayer meetings. Wednesday night, the pastor laid hands on and prayed with me. My brother report came back perfect. I don't have to go back for a liver check for six months. And the cholesterol and passing were down. I feel great. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Praise, Praise God. God. Praise His name. Thank you. Amen. I like that. Amen. You can move the marble and move the marble and never say anything, and does God get the glory? No. You move the marble, He knows. Sometimes it's good for the body to know. Yeah. Someone else tonight. I love it when it says, He hung a soul in the cliff of the rock. When I think of a rock, I think how about before that he has, He's got me perfect on the cliff of the rock. He loves me. He loves me. And I love Him supremely. He's so good. I love the Lord. In your message this morning, you know you sit down the message. <laughs> that was wonderful. Wonderful. Pastor. Thank you. Love a little bit of it. Thank you, Jesus. Was Roger been nicer to you today? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I told my husband, this is amazing because he leaned over to me in the Sunday school class before the message and said, You look so good. I said, Thank you. 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 Thank I don't know what it says, Danny, I give you every Sunday. It suits you up, but I'm going to have to shut down on that. <laughs> Thank you, David. I was going to say, the marble I moved this morning, it, it wasn't for Paul. Paul's a whole other story. I could move marbles all day long. But my marble move this morning was for Savannah. You know, Savannah's. She's a good Christian girl. She was born and raised right here in this church. She was in this church every revival. Every, in fact, I was doing youth back then. Her and Hannah were drugged to every event imaginable. But it wasn't until she moved in with these two roommates. These two good, it, I prayed so hard for her friends. But she's moved in with two girls that are in the same level nursing school. Really good Christian girls. They have Bible study at their house on Thursday nights. Um, she goes to Grace with them. But she has really started digging into the Word. And she'll she'll text me um, three or four times a week something about that she learned something that she never had put it Amen. put it together. Right. So I'm um, sending your prayer right there. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I might just move a marble for that too. <laughs> You got a lot of preachers here tonight. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and you've got one lady here that's taking notes. Good. Well, I just wanted you to realize that you'd be on your toes. <laughs> I'm ready. I used to have the time six passages in my when I was preaching. But they didn't take notes. A couple of them, please. <laughs> the one. Yep. Oh, okay. But uh, this church has been my rock. It's been my rock that I died in. It's been a uh, place, safe haven, regardless of where I go or what I do or whatever's going on in my life. I always know that I have a safe haven here. Is that on? I don't know. But anyway. Am I not loud tonight? Yeah, you loud tonight. Okay. <laughs> I didn't go to school long enough for that. They didn't have those back. I heard it. <laughs> but uh, you know, we take a lot of things for granted. I'll never take my God for granted. Amen. Never. Because he's with me constantly. And it's a wonderful thing just to serve in any time, at every time. But it's nice to have a safe place to come and right. be loved unconditionally by people that you walked with, talked with, cried with, and been through all kinds of the 
things that happen in this world. But this church is my my rock where I can come and Amen. hide. <laughs> but I'm not hiding from God. No. That is His hands over this church, and His mighty hand reaches down and touches people in it daily, hourly, weekly. And, uh, the jar is proof, but uh, the presence you feel when you walk in this place is really the proof of who God is and what He is. You may need to get a bigger jar. I'm not going to preach anymore. I'll pass it over to the next preach. <laughs> Pastor, this afternoon, uh, talking about praises, Kathy King had such a praise on Facebook that so blessed me. She said that Larry had turned the corner and he was so much better. And he was fixing to go to rehab maybe a couple of times a week or so and try to get stronger that he had been so weak just laying around. But she couldn't wait to get back in her church. And that blessed me so much. Amen. And I texted her back and told her I couldn't wait for her to get back here too. We're looking forward to the day that Amen. they can come and worship. But it's a beautiful testimony. Wonderful. I, I don't know anyone here except Shirley, but well, I know over. Jesus. <laughs> and um, one of my favorite verses is trust in the Lord with all your heart, not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. In the leaning on His Word, um, His Word has got me through so much. And I'm thankful that I have His Word. And I'm just going to say, it's in Christ alone, by grace, through faith, in Christ alone, that we come to Him, not of anything that we've done, so God gets all the glory. Amen. I do have a good friend. She's a keeper. Bass fishing, we call her a keeper. I need a couple of ushers tonight. There we go. Come on, Trace. Trace and Cruz. Gentlemen, we're going to have a little different run tonight. I have... I, I uh, want you guys to come forward. And what we're going to do is uh, we are going to, to uh, first of all, take the offering. Once they come back to the front, the music's going to continue to play. And we're going to give something to you. So uh, they're going to come back with a bowl. You see the bowls, boys? I want you to pass the bowls out. And uh, we want to give everybody a container of Play-Doh. I don't want you to wait. Once you get it, I want you to immediately begin to create it. Whatever comes to your mind, I want you to begin to play with your Plato guests in church. And so I want you to begin to create whatever's in your mind. And during the offering, the kids can come up front because we're going to have a little fun up here in front. So if uh, my uh, boys and girls mind coming up uh, when we begin the, uh, the offertory. So gentlemen, if you will, first go get the offering and then come back and pass out the Plato. Let's pray first. <laughs> Cruz, would you pray for us, please? Lord, help us to yes.
Tonight, Becky is going to come and lead us in a song. And y'all create you your heart's content as she ministers to us in music. Don't use your feet. Your mom will be upset. As long as I'm reading, you have time. But once I finish reading, i kind of like for you to be through with your portion of whatever you're creating. So whether you're creating a rock, 
or a snake or a plate. I saw a bracelet a while ago. Whatever it is, a tree, a stick man, whatever. I want you to go ahead and be creating until I am through with Scripture. When I'm through with Scripture, I want you to be completed, okay? Is that fair? Awesome, okay. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Y'all can multitask, can't you? A little harder for the older people than the younger, but you guys can multitask, can't you? You can listen and shake. Okay, so you got about two minutes. Ready? Here we go. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaking from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of the potter? So are you in my mind, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repented of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I have planned. And if another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Now therefore, say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says, Look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. They will reply, It is no use. We will continue with our own plans. Each of us will follow the stubbornness of his evil heart. Stop. Whatever you've made, whatever you've made, I want you to stop. Now, for those out there that have your creation great, some of you will about to be joined to the front. But for you kids, I want you to take your creation that you have made. I want you to go out and find somebody in the audience, bring them to the front with you, and tell them to bring their Bible and their item that they have made, okay? Now here's what you can do. Actually, I'm not going to give you too many instructions. So I want you to go get somebody by the hand. Somebody that's made something really cool, you can mingle and look real quick and come back to the front, okay? Let's do it real quick. Go get somebody and bring them to the front, okay? There we go. All the creators and their little creations, they're getting someone to come worship with them, okay? Oh, they're, they're going and getting mom and nana. Ah, <laughs> oh, y'all don't need to be shy. You know these people. Come on, Donnie. Bring your creation and come on down. The price isn't right. <laughs> All right, we have yeah, the price is in page. We have we have two down here front. Now we have three. Hi. Come on, Marcia. She asked. So how you doing, guys? Raj, I think you have a, I think you have an applicant there. Come on down, Raj. Come on down. Okay, Trace. All right, everybody, y'all can sit this side, this side. You can move trash out of the way, whatever you need to do. Trace, why don't you sit right there? All right. Now, here's the instruction at this point. You can tell your teammate what you were making. Okay? Now, I want you to trade your creation and tell them what you made. Okay? So trade right now. 
Trade. Now tell them what you made and trade, okay? Y'all go ahead and trade. All right. Now, here's what I want you to do. I do not want you to change what they made. I want you to try to keep it intact, but I want you to make it better. It may not mean it's better in the eyes of the original creator, but I want the new creator to create in that essence of what they started to make and create something that you think would be even more cool, even better, okay? So go ahead and trade. And uh, as we sing this song, I want you to go ahead and begin to recreate what they started on and make it even better, okay? If y'all want to trade, you can. If not, that's all right. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took you just to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. Well, there really ought to be a sign upon my heart. Don't judge me yet, there's an unfinished part. But I'll be perfect just according to his plan. Fashioned by the master's loving hand. Sing with me, here we go. He's still working on me To make me what I ought to be It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars Sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars How loving and patient he must be He's still working on me Now guys, you only have one more verse in chorus so whatever you're going to do, you're going to have to do quickly. Here we go. In the mirror of the Lord's Word, reflection that I see makes me wonder why He never gave up on me. But I'll be perfect just according to His plan. Remember, He's the potter, I'm the clay. There we go. He's still working on me. Oh, it's looking good, y'all. Make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars. Are you finished? The sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. Amen. Oh yeah, you know it. He's still working on me. Amen. Amen. All right. Trade back. Trade back. Now get your gift back. All right? All right. Now, I want, first of all, I want Marcia and uh, uh, <laughs> Emmy, Emmy and Ellie. What parents did that? Oh, no. Uh, Emmy, Marsha, would you stand? Now, Marsha, what was it that you had made? I made a snowman. You made a snowman. Now, you got to turn around. you got to show everybody a snowman. Okay. Now, you were not the final creator in this snowman. And how do you think that your, your co-creator here did with your snowman? Did they do a good job? Yes, they did. Okay. Did they kind of improve on it? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, Emmy, tell me, what did you make? Show everybody. What is it? Oh, you both made snowmen. We didn't know it either. <laughs> and you didn't know it. We put the two snowmen together. Okay. So, is it a snowman or a snowwoman? Okay, snowmen. No sexism here. Okay. So, now, I want to ask you, do you think that your co-creator helped a little bit? Did she do some final touches that you like? No comment, huh? That's okay. Let's give them a good hand and they can be seated. All right. Now this was 
This was some pretty radical transformation up here. Okay, y'all stand. I like what I saw here. Now, I really think both of them, in their co-creation, in their working together with each other, made some pretty good things. So tell me what you made. You made a bowl. Now, did your co-creator kind of help you a little bit and, and put some touching edges on it? Raise it up. Show everybody. I, it looked like a turtle shell when he got through with it. But I kind of think that his co-creator did a really good job. Okay. Donnie, what did you make? Well, I made a cup, but I didn't get the So show everybody your cup. So when it came up here, it looked more like a bowl. But when you told him it was a cup, what did he do? He put a handle on it. Give me five. Let's give him a hand. All right. What do we have here, Roger Dodger? We have a cross. Y'all stand up. You made a ball. Okay. So let me ask you, did Mr. Roger help you make the ball any better? No, it's just as good. Roger didn't do anything. Okay, so tell me what you made. He never does. I made a cross. Yes. And, and uh, Avery suggested that we put love. Oh, okay. So we put it across and up and down. I love it. Let's give him a hand. All right. Okay, so what did we do over here? Um, Y'all can stand. So, Trace, what did you make originally? What did you make? It's a totem pole. It's a totem pole. Okay. Did she kind of help you make that? Yep. Okay. So, what did you make? I made a donut. And I noticed that he worked on it. Yes, he did. I thought it. I thought he made a pretty good donut with what you had, okay? Y'all can all go back to your seats. I, I, I'm proud of you guys. Y'all can be seated. Oh, just take it with you. Don't eat it. Whenever we look into Scripture, there's so many pictures of God. And when we look in Scripture... Everyone presented God differently. In the New Testament, we see that Jesus presents God as an absentee landowner. That He put people in charge of His kingdom. In one place, Jesus refers to God as a sower who sows and sows liberally. You know that story. King David as well as Jesus speaks about God as being a shepherd. All of these images. But I love Jeremiah and Isaiah because both of them speak about God as being a potter. When we read this story today, this is actually part A of the story. But God tells Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the potter's house. And I will give my message to you. So Jeremiah goes. Many times the Lord says, I want you to go to that Scripture. And I go, okay. I go to that Scripture. I have no idea what He's going to do with me in that Scripture that week. But I love the fact when God sends me to a place. He sent me to two people to visit this week one day. And it was just like, wow, that was so cool. You never know what's going to happen. But God said, Jeremiah, I have a message for the people. And you're going to have to get it by going down to the potter's house. And when he goes to the potter's house, he begins to watch in anticipation. Because in his spirit, he has already sensed that God had something to say. As he pulls up to the table, and he watches that potter, as he takes a lump of clay that is kind of stale and at some point drying in his hand, and he takes it and he throws it down on the wheel and he puts water and he begins to knead it. So that water represents actually in the New Testament the Holy Spirit that comes and makes the clay pliable that it actually will stick together and be shapeable. And then he reaches with his big toe and he puts it into the rung that's on the bottom of the table on a pedestal that now up top has a bigger kind of a tabletop round surface area where he's working. 
he gives that lower level a kick with his big toe and it spins and he kicks it and he kicks it until it's spinning fast enough and then he just takes his hand and he just shoves it into that clay and he gets clay all up his hand and his sleeve and splatters across his chest. You see, God doesn't care about the messiness of our life. He loves us. And He takes us from the earth, from the dirt and the mess of life. He puts His Holy Spirit on us so that we'll adhere together and we can be malleable. And then He kicks that table of life and He begins to shake us and He gets His hands. And I, I love that picture of, the, of God as His potter, which very clearly in His vision or in His picture is God as this potter is working with this clay, all of a sudden, as he is spreading out the base, and as he's shaping the net to make whatever he's making, and as he's putting a rim on it, somewhere in the process, the clay mars in his hand. There's this thin spot. There's a stick. There's a piece of gravel. Something has caused the clay to be unapproachable and unshakable. If he were to take that pot at that place in time and put it in the fire, it would have a thin wall or a misshapen place. It would not be fit to use. And so what he does is he just looks at it, shakes his head, and just goes, SMASH! Begins to work it again from that nothing stage and begins to shape it again. He pulls out the foreign object, or he shapes it in a different way to a shape that the clay will manage and, and handle. And he takes that pot, that clay on the table, and if God is represented by the potter, guess who we are? We are the clay. The nation of Israel in this story was the clay. And God is saying, if a potter can change his mind, if a potter can put the finishing touches to it by changing his mind and doing something different, going a different direction because it marred in his hand, then why can't I work with you? Why do I have to start all over? Why do every day I have to start as if it was the first day? Why can't I come in the shop and look at you and go, Oh, my little dirt ball, I'm so glad to work with you today. Why do I have to keep whining and crying and beginning again? I want you to know today, boys and girls and adults, that we are the clay. He has put His Holy Spirit in us so that we are malleable. He has put His Spirit in us so that we can respond to His touch. He has given us the instruction of the Word, but He's put His Spirit on us so that He can be relational with us and touch us and we respond to His touch. And He can shape us into the fashion and the life and the person that He wants us to be. But He says to the people of Israel, He says, don't you know when I... Look at a nation and they're not doing what they're supposed to do because of sin. I smashed them back down to the to the bare essence to begin again, only for them to keep doing what they did the first time. It's almost like a person who goes to the mirror in the morning and looks and they've got a cow look and they go, huh? And they go on. They come back by the mirror to brush their teeth, they look, oh. And they do something about that. And they go on and they put on their clothes. They come back and they go, yeah, it's still there. After a while, you get callous to it. And you don't care that you have a cowlick. You don't care that something's wrong. You want to do it your own way and have your own little hairdo. So you just go out in the public. And they go, did you look in the mirror? Yep, I did. Five times. Why didn't you fix that? Now by the mission, by the you, I can't see it. Why is it your problem? We get calloused. We get callous to our sin. We get callous to our mistakes. 
I want you to understand that this vessel on this wheel belonged to the potter. It was His. The nation of Israel was His. They had walked with Him. They had walked with Him. He had blessed them. He had developed them as a nation. And they were a stubborn and a sinful, callous flock. It didn't matter that they had already suffered drought. They got their little healing and they quit their little sinning. And as soon as water came, hey, they did it again. Over and over. So basically what Jeremiah is saying is, guess what, old house of Israel? When I see a nation that's sinning, I warn them, hey, you're about to face disaster. And if they'll listen to me, if they'll soften their heart, if they'll respond in repentance, I'll forgive them. And I'll hold back the disaster I intended to give them. Then he said, if I see a nation that I'm going to bless, and I go in and tell them, oh, buddy, I love you. Look at what we're doing together. Look at how we're accomplishing. I'm going to make great things out of you. And they go off and sin. Guess what? I will repent that I had planned good and I will give evil. I want you to know today that this whole thing of Christian living is what God had in mind from the very beginning. I want you to know it was His plan to put His Spirit inside of you. From every prophet, from every angle you read the Old Testament, God intended to give us a Savior. Not so that we could obey rules and get it done. That was the Old Testament law. But so that there can be a spark of His Spirit inside of us. It was almost like handing us over to another governor and saying, so you weren't getting it by just hearing my word occasionally from the pulpit. I'm going to be speaking in your head every day. Because when Jesus is our Savior, He is shaping us into the image that He wants us to be. And what's so beautiful about the New Testament is that God said, here, I'm going to pour a little water on you. I'm going to pour this water on you, my Spirit, on the last and greatest day of the feast. Jesus said, I am the living water, and He who comes to Me from him will flow streams of living water. And then there's the pretext that says he was talking about the Spirit that would come after he was ascended into heaven. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. You are in the relationship of your life. Don't throw it away. You are in the relationship of the King of Kings who lovingly has his hands elbow deep in your life. Don't kick against him. If He wants to fix this shallow place of your life, let Him. If He wants to start all over for Pete's sake, let Him. If He wants to pull out a twig or a pebble, let Him. The bottom line is this. The Holy Spirit is in your life to shape you into the image of Christ. That's His job. That's His purpose. That's His desire. Are you willing Oh man, kids, how hard was it? Kids, kids, how hard was it for you to let go of your design and give it to a co-creator? Wasn't hard at all, the kids say. Adults, how hard was it? They're going to mess it up. <laughs> and yet, from what I saw, I think almost every one of them was better. When your co-creator got their hands involved, listen to me. God chooses to work with you. God chooses to speak and you respond. Don't get callous. Don't get hard-hearted. Don't get stubborn. Well, I've always done this way. I'm going to do it this way again. Well, I'm just doing my best, Pastor. Well, then quit. Quit doing your best. And do it His way. 
be clay in the potter's hands. That is the picture of this passage. That is the picture of what it means to walk in relationship with God. I told you that was part A of the story. There's a part B to the story. It's really cool. In chapter 19, the Lord said, go buy a clay jar. I want you to know something. The blood of Jesus has bought me. The blood of Jesus has taken the stain of sin away. I know I'm in the Old Testament talk is redeemed. Jesus has paid the price for my redemption. I'm not my own anyway. I've been bought with a price. Go buy a clay jar. Take it. Take along some of the elders of the peace people. Go get some of the priests and go down to the pot sheared's gate at the entrance of the city. And there proclaim the words that I'm going to say. I'm saying them for the people of Jerusalem, for the people of Judea, for the kings. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. I'm going to bring disaster. No more fun and games. No more second chances. No more, I'm so sorry, I'll try better. Quit trying and let him live in you. Let him shape you. Go buy a jar. Go down to the potsherd's gate. This is a very important gate because it's the gate that opens out into a field that used to be a potter's place. And the land is now devastated because they've taken the good soil out and left just junk there on the ground. Then everybody needed a place to put the trash, so everybody went and dumped the trash in the, in the valley and on there outside of the pot shears gate. And so now you have the rubble of the city, the old throwaways, broken vessels, broken things, old swing sets, not really. All that junk is in the valley of Hinnom. And there's something else that has taken over the valley of Hinnom. Since there's already smoke there, since it's already a place of refuse, the garbage dump, since it stinks like hell and it burns like hell and there's smoke like hell, well, let's just do hellish deeds there. And so the people of Israel, you can read it for yourself, would go out there into that valley and they would build these pillars to their Baal gods and they would take their sons <coughs> and put them on those pillars and kill them. Y'all didn't... you never read that? You didn't know that? Humans sacrificing their eldest born to the gods of Baal. God said, I never asked you to do that. Why do we do some of the things that we do trying to get the life that we want and God never asks for that? I'm going to bring disaster on this place and will make the ears of everyone tingle. They have forsaken me and made this place of foreign gods and have burned sacrifices in it to gods that neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah ever knew. And they filled this place with the blood of innocence. Verse 6. So the wear of the day is coming declares the Lord when the plea people will no longer call this place Topheth or the valley of Ben-Hinnom, but they will call it the valley of slaughter. Why? Because you have become rigid become stubborn. You're not malleable anymore. And I can't change you. And so basically what Scripture says is you're going to be in pieces. You're going to be destroyed. There will be no more city. There will be no more worship. There will be no more doing it your way and messing up my way. I want you to know, while the illustration doesn't work, I can never take that jar 
and do anything with it again. It's broken. And so the illustration doesn't work anymore, but basically what God is doing is He says, I will do a new thing. If you'll become shapeable and malleable, not so I can just do something new and then you can do your own thing. I will make you a perpetual state of shapeable and malleable. Because you and I will walk through life together. I don't know if you worship a static God or not. But He's still working on me. I don't know if you're in a position, well, I'm saved, sanctified, petrified, waiting for my thing right on. I'm a little worried about that. I don't think that that's good theology. We all face troubles and trials. We do face crashing moments that bring our lives to the need, our knees. Whether it's judgment from God or whether it's just life. But if we will listen, there are hands that come and scoop us up and put us back on the wheel and a big toe that kicks the spindle and gets us spinning into a dizziness and then He begins to shape us into something new. And He pours the Holy Spirit on us so that we'll adhere together and be able to be shapeable in His hands. God is still working on His people. He's working on us individually, but He's also working on us as a whole. Praise His wonderful name. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Heavenly Father, I don't think we have enough people in here tonight. I think we needed the Presbyterians and the Baptists. I think we needed the Pentecostals, Assemblies of God. We needed everybody. But Lord, as our nation gets a few crushings, would you help us as the body of Jesus Christ rise to a new level? I do want my life to be shapeable and malleable. I do want my church to be shapeful and malleable. But oh God, would you help the body of Christ that's bigger than America? Would you help the body of Christ that's in America and Africa to explode? Would you help us to grow? Not just in numbers, but in spiritual integrity? Would you help us to be vessels for your using, oh God? Would you put your apron back on and go back to work in our lives? Teach us what we need to know. Shape us by your Spirit. Help us to be wholly thine. I ask in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Where you're sitting now is your altar. Don't let me sing, preach, and pray and you go unchanged. If there's any area of your life where He has convicted you, would you just say, touch me here, Lord. Shake me there. Remove this scar. Remove this blemish. Remove this stick, this gravel. Remove this stubborn nature of me. Would you just give Him permission to work in your life today? What a privilege it is to be holy thine. Father, you've heard our prayers. Many of us have asked for help and guidance. I don't want to be remiss as we dismiss tonight, but I pray in the name of Jesus that you will help Larry as he is beginning a recovery. Praise your name. Lord, I ask that you will continue to be with Tom until we know ourselves and hear with our ears that he is well, would you please be his best friend and his guide and his help. Raise him to new life and do not let the enemy whisper in his ear. Please give the enemy laryngitis and let him only hear of your love and your hope and your purpose until you come to take him home. Give him life and give him help that he may be a stormtrooper for you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you.